you're visiting with us or new, you just have to understand we generally just try uh, to go through a book of the Bible and just uh, take what comes at us, but trusting that God loves us and he gave these to us in a certain order. So we're kind of in a transition passage this morning between two parables uh, about money. So it's Luke 16, and we'll begin with uh, verse 14. But again, welcome to all of you. Welcome to Alex's family. Glad you could uh, be here. Um, uh, Faith and Rich, if you're watching online, you probably couldn't hear the prayers for you, but please know we love you and, and uh, are with you in every step. Um, and then just the one last little logistical thing, but I think it points out that we're part of a wider community. You'll see as we end worship, there'll be a bunch of people going to the fellowship hall. They are not invaders. Uh, they are a sister church called The River, whose fellowship hall had a small fire. So for their meetings, uh, we are very delighted uh, to have them meet with us, to welcome them and, and uh, get out of their way and all that good stuff. So we're uh, delighted to be able to do that. But now let's, let's hear God's word. Luke 16, we're going to begin with verse 14 and just read through verse 18. Uh, this last verse might hit some of you a little dip more difficultly, but please understand that it points us to God's grace. Let's, let's hear God's word. The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all of these things, and they ridiculed him, Jesus. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. The law and the prophets were until John. Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached, and everyone forces his way into it. But it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery, and he who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. This is the word of the Lord, and thanks be to God. Uh, Our God and Father, as we have just read that the good news of the kingdom of God has been preached since the time of John, would that be true this morning? Would we, O Lord, would we each hear good news from you, that we would hear about your love for us despite our own failings, as as Robert has already prayed, that we would know that our standing before you is based on your love, not our works. Would that be clear? And would that not just be clear, but as the other Robert has prayed, would that good news then spread from our body to others? And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever uh, been uh, started a new thing, started a new group, a new place where making a good impression, a good first impression was very, very important? Maybe in a lab that you just joined, or a, a new a class, uh, or a new organization on campus, or a new workplace, maybe at a family wedding, a bunch of cousins you haven't met, and, and it's important for you, you think, to make a good first impression. For me, That was very important in my first job out of college, which was a a mechanized infantry battalion. And I was coming in as one of the medics, the the young lieutenant in charge of the medics. So what we did automatically, I didn't really fit. There were about 45 officers, and only about three or four of us were non-infantry. So all these guys had a fraternity, and I was already on the outsider, uh, outside. But it didn't help that my predecessor was very well thought of. His name was Brad. And he did a really good job and presented himself very well. Plus, he was like super tall. He was like 6'5 and well built. And he had this very confident air about him. But as I, I got to know him, and he was very kind and kind of tra- helping me transition, I kind of realized a lot of that was just on the surface. That he really just let the sergeants do all the work, which meant he was smart, actually. But uh, there were some things that weren't so good. So when I did a, an inventory of the equipment, I found out that he had kind of hidden some stuff or lost some stuff. And the the way the Army works, if you lose stuff, you pay for it. So I felt bad. I kind of made him have to pay for some stuff. But hey, that was the reality. 
But, but making an impression among the officer corps was even harder for me in the realm of athletics. I was one of the shortest in the battalion, and I did not, I looked kind of nerdy, gray. I had these big round glasses, my hair stuck up, they called me Bart Simpson. Uh, uh, but I, I actually wasn't that bad of an athlete, particularly in sports like croquet and badminton. I was, I, I, in high school, me and this guy named Kiki, we dominated the, 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 the gym class in badminton. Uh, then later when I went to college and played a bunch of international students, I realized I wasn't very good at that either. But I remember this one time where the officers were gathering very, it was like my first week there, and there was a, a we had a mandatory social bowling on the, on, at Fort Stewart. And I was, you know, an okay bowler. You know, half of them would be kind of like gutter balls, but the other half would be strikes, so kind of you average it out. It wasn't too bad. And every time my superior officers looked over to me and Brad, he would get a strike, and they'd be like, good shot, Brad. And then uh, every time they looked at me, I was getting gutter balls, and they're just like, oh, all right, that's this new guy. But then there were times when I would get strikes, perfect shots, and I'd turn around and no one's looking. And that's just the way it was. It even got worse when we played an invented sport that they made up called cotton ball, because we were the cotton balers. That's a whole other story. Uh, and the rules for cotton ball were very simple. Basically, there were no rules. There are two goals set up by, by orange cones, and you, we played with a football, and you had a guy in each of those cones, each of those goals, two teams, and you would get a score if you passed it to the guy standing in. That's it. And that's it. Seems simple, right? Except there were no rules. Anything was legal. There's no referee. Full contact. And it's so bad, in fact, that my colonel made us, me bring a couple of medics with a stretcher and a first aid kit. And he would do calculations like what were acceptable losses uh, to play this. I'm not even making that up. And I was, again, and I wasn't too bad, but nobody was passing me the ball. They're like, he's not going to be able to score. And I was actually doing pretty well, but I was going to be super aggressive, trying to make a good impression, until they threw the ball to this other guy in the other team. And he was, if Brad was six and a half, this guy was like seven feet tall. Uh, one of the, and, and, and he took, and I charged at him to try to get the ball from him. And he took the ball, held it up, and he took his other hand, and he held my, my, my head like that. And I'm doing this number, trying to, and everyone's just laughing at me. It was, it was absolutely kind of humiliating. When I, when I, believe it or not, when I look at our text this morning, I feel that same kind of trauma, <laughs> that same uh, kind of like, I don't, I'm not made to fit, I'm not good enough. And that's based on the second half of verse 16, where the good news of the kingdom of God is preached. That sounds wonderful. But then, every, the way my Bible, your pew Bibles may say something different, Everyone's forcing his way into it, but the older translations say, and the violent take hold of it. The only people that can make it in are the violent, the forceful. And the reason why that's traumatic to me is the first time I heard this taught was it was taught, I was in a new youth group, and there was a huge guy. Why is everybody huge in my life? But anyway, uh, th there was this huge guy who was a former football player and a former successful banker, who, and then he became a youth pastor. And he taught this text, and he said the, the, the kingdom of God is only for those with energy, who force their way in, who take charge, who get things done, that are super successful. That's kind of the way he taught it. And it made the rest of us feel like we didn't fit, we didn't belong, because we're not particularly violent. And he, that's the way he preferred the translation. The, the word here is a little difficult. Uh, that the, the, It's for the violent, it's for the energetic, it's for the strong. So what... What does this verse really mean? Did Alex come before us this morning to get baptized because she's forcing her way in? Because she is strong and energetic and mighty? Well, yes and no. So I want us to try to figure out what this verse means. Now again, the context is important. Luke is string as he has done his research and he's stringing these teachings together. He has made a choice to put these passages in here. These verses, uh, they, they, the, uh, especially the one on divorce, shows up at different places in the other Gospels. So what, the context is money, and Jesus is telling his disciples that money is good, but if you love it, then it becomes an idol, basically. Uh, that, that, that money can buy sort of power and happiness temporarily, but it does not last. 
Money is very tempting for us because it, it's solid. You can see it. You can let the coins run through your fingers, right? Have you ever done that? It's kind of fun. <laughs> Or, or you look at your bank statements and your 401ks and you, 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 you want to see them grow. It, and, and so it, it, it's something that you put your hope in. But it never lasts. What Jesus is teaching in this chapter and throughout his ministry is that he, this, is the, this is the good news. This is what Christians believe. That, that Jesus came to bring not just blessing in this life, but to bring us eternal life. You, you can't even do the math on it. That we would, we were going to live forever and in the new heavens and the new earth there will be no suffering, no pain, no sin. That's where we are heading and so therefore we ought to actually live that way. That, that we ought to spend our money in a way of, that, that reflects that we're not putting our hope in it but that we believe in eternal life. And so this sort of odd assortment of sayings kind of fits into that theme. Now, I, I just have to say at the beginning, it, it, it does seem odd that, that, that Luke puts divorce in this. So we need to begin by trying to understand that. But before we get there, the context is, is verse 14. That the fair, he's speaking to a group of Jews called the Pharisees. And look at this. They were lovers of money. And so they're ridiculing Jesus for him teaching them not to depend on it. Now, contrary to popular opinion, the Pharisees were not particularly rich. That was another group of Jews called the Sadducees and, of course, the tax collectors. The Pharisees were from among the people, but apparently they loved money. So what does that mean? Well, they were known for their, their seriousness. They were the ones that really served God. Just ask them. And they wanted everyone to know it. And that included the way they, they spent their money. You see, look at what he says in verse 15. He says, you are those who justify yourselves, what? Before men. They care about what others think about them. Uh, as Jesus tells us elsewhere, they, they love the good seats in the synagogues. They wanted to be up front. They wanted to be called teacher. They wore fancy clothes so that they would get respect. Uh, the image and reputation were very important to them, and that must have included the way they spent their money. So they, they might have spent it in good ways, but it was always in a way it could be seen by men. As Jesus says, they, they gave uh, uh, ostentatiously so everybody saw what they were giving. And that's why Jesus tells us to, to give in a way that your left hand doesn't even know what your right hand is giving. That, that you're giving as unto the Lord and not caring whether you get credit for it or not. So, I mean, let's just give it a practical choice. If you have $10,000 that you just want to give, and some of you are like, oh, that would be, that would be great. If you had, just had $10,000, you, you could do a couple of things with it. Let's say you wanted to do it through our church. You could give it to missionaries, look in the back and maybe split it up among five, uh, and that would be a wonderful thing, but you may never see the results. It's giving in a way that hopefully leads to eternal fruit. People come to faith. You'll get to meet them in heaven, but you, you won't be able to see it. Or let's say we need a, a, a new big memorial storage shed. I, I don't know if $10,000 could buy that, but let's just say it will, and you're going to get your name on it, a, a placard. You'll buy a $9,000 shed and, a, and spend $1,000 on a big golden plate that says you're the one who gave it. Now, don't mishear me. There's no right or wrong. On, you could give either way. Uh, both are needed. We need buildings and so forth. Don't, don't mishear me. But the, the point is, is why, are you, why are you spending your money the way you are? Is it to be seen by men? Now, all of that then interprets the next few verses, that, including the one on divorce. That's what I want us to be able to understand. So it could be that they were... It could be the Pharisees just loved money and, 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 and loved material things like preachers who wear designer sneakers uh, to show they are success. I don't you know that's a thing. I don't hear it might be like a gold-plated pocket square. I don't know. The, the, the point is, is that the, their love of money was outward focused. So I want to answer three questions, try to answer three questions this morning. Again, why is this bit about divorce in here and... Um, It'd be something I'd be happy to ignore or relegate to Sunday school, but we try to teach the Word of God as it comes. 
But it does apply to all of us. In context, I think you'll see how it brings us to Christ. Secondly, what does it mean that what is exalted among men is an abomination before God? That, that seems harsh. And then finally, what is this verse 16 about, about the violent forcing their way into the kingdom? So we'll, I think these all fit together. Let's, let's start with divorce at the end. He says, everyone who divorces his wife, marries another, commits adultery, and, and the same with women. Now, I want to say two things about this. And if you're, again, new here, please, this is not you know, something we, we speak on a lot, but this is the word of God. First of all, this is not all that Jesus has to say about this or the scriptures. If you want a more complete teaching, you'd go to Mark 10 or Matthew 19, 1 Corinthians 7. It, again, it's better left for Sunday school to get into details. But in short, even with this verse, what you need to hear is that most churches, including ours, believe that there is such a thing as permissible divorce in certain circumstances. What Jesus is teaching about here is willy-nilly divorce, where you get tired of your spouse and trade them in for a younger model like the world does. That, that's what he's teaching against here. But life is not perfect. Some marriage covenants are broken. In short, if in cases of adultery or abandonment, and abandonment is not just physically moving to another city, although that does happen, but where there is physical abuse or threatenings or breaking the law, there are times where it is better for divorce to occur. And in that case, the more innocent spouse is permitted to marry again, and it would not be adultery, it would not be sin. And in fact, many churches teach, and I believe myself, that even if you are the more guilty party, you're the one that caused the marriage to break up, and you have done everything you can to repent and try to repair the marriage, if it's not going to work, I believe you are also free to remarry at that point, and you are not sinning. So you all need to know, if you're new here, that we have a number of members who have been through this. Two, I, I think I can say, because it's public, that two of our elders uh, have been through divorces. Adultery and divorce, neither one is the unforgivable sin, and in some cases, it is the best case. So, so why is Jesus putting this here? Why is Luke choosing to put this statement here? It's because Jesus is rebuking the Pharisees for their outward show. How, what do I mean? Remember how to interpret a, a hard verse like this. It's, all, it's like real estate. What's the most important rule in real estate? Location, right? What's the second rule? Lo location. It's three rules, right? Location, location, location. With a verse, it's the same thing. Context, context, context. And so Jesus is rebuking them for their outward appearance. And then look at verse 17. It is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. And then he goes on to talk about the way they were treating marriage. Because the Pharisees were picking and choosing. They were keeping the laws that made them look good. They let everyone know how much they prayed. They prayed on street corners. They cut up their spices into tents to, to make a show of their, their tithing. But then on other matters that were more important, they actually gave themselves slack. They gave themselves mulligans. And that was the case with marriage at the time. We know this from Deuteronomy 24, where marriage is regulated because what would happen is somebody would get tired of their wife, they'd marry another wife, they'd get tired of her, and they'd go back to the first one. And Moses does not permit that. Because they're treating their, usually the, 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 the wife, they're treating her like a commodity, not a covenant partner that they should live and sacrifice for. And so Jesus says, Moses permits it because your hearts were hard. And at the time of Jesus, various Jewish schools arose. There was the Shammai school that was more strict about keeping marriage together. But there is a school called Hillel which a lot of the Pharisees bought into, which said a man could divorce a woman. It's always, it was almost always the man that was given the rights. That's the case. And they, they said a man could divorce his wife for a simple thing like if she burned the dinner. It's literally in there. Or if she spun in the streets, whatever that means. Or if she spoke disapprovingly, all he would have to say is I divorce you and that would be divorced. And so Jesus is saying, don't you know, you think you're keeping God's law but you're breaking it over here. The Ten Commandments is not a buffet option. 
we don't get to say which parts of God's law we get to keep. As James says, if we break the law at one point, we've broken all the law. So now some of you are saying, who are maybe never been through this, you're saying, I'm still in trouble then. Because maybe I've never gotten divorced. Maybe I'm really good at certain rules, like I'm keeping the Sabbath. Look, I'm here today. But then you think, I don't want God to look at my language or my coveting, or my, the, the growing anger and bitterness in my life, or the fact that I lie a little bit, just, just when I need to. Because you know deep down that even if you can keep God's law outwardly, even if outwardly you're sure, you, you know that keeping God's law also means from the heart, as we've prayed several times today, and as Jesus says, God looks at the hearts. So you look up at verse 15, and you, and you say, God's looking at my heart. That's actually not a comfort to me. I, I, that, that's actually scary that he sees my inner thoughts. I remember one time after worship, um, I guess I was a little bit down or something, I don't know, but um, a woman who's, who's no longer with us, she's in glory, um, she said to me, she, she was trying to encourage me, and she, I think she tapped me on the chest and said, remember, Chris, God knows your heart. And I said, that, that's what scares me. <laughs> He, he, I don't show you all the stuff I'm thinking up front, but God sees it. So this is, this is where it brings us to the gospel. This is what is so encouraging about this. This is what Alex's baptism points us to the grace of God. It's, as, as Heath has said, it's not about her ability to keep God's law. It's the fact that she couldn't. We don't get into heaven by keeping God's law perfectly. It's because we know that we can't. And then Jesus, our Savior, came and he kept every law perfectly. Then he offered himself as the sacrifice in our place. He becomes the substitute for us. So he has kept the law perfectly, the only man who has done so. And then his blood is shed so that we can be forgiven. Somehow we get, look, if you believe in Jesus, somehow we are credited with his perfection. So we are free to come to God and say, my heart's a mess. I have lied. I, I've not been faithful to my spouse even, and you can come and ask for forgiveness and know that is why Jesus came, to forgive sinners. So I want to be clear here. If the Pharisees had heard Jesus say this and any one of them had said to him, I have done this, I have broken this, please forgive me, then they would have been forgiven. If any of the Pharisees had said to Jesus, I'm listening to you. I'm being convicted that I love money too much. Please forgive me. They would have been forgiven. The reason why Jesus is teaching the, these difficult passages is so that we wouldn't give ourselves mulligans, right? That we wouldn't think, okay, well, I only have to do so much good to get into God. No, God wants us to be perfect. I mean, we, look, would you want to go to heaven if other people are still sinning against you? That wouldn't be a fun place. Or if you still wrestle with your own heart, that wouldn't be a fun place. No, there, heaven is going to be a place where there's only love and goodness and joy uh, and health. And in order to get there, we must have all our sins forgiven. And if you have believed in Jesus, that's the promise of the gospel. This water was not a partial symbol of forgiveness. It didn't say, Alex, so far you're okay, now don't mess up from now on. It's saying, Alex, you are going to live forever because of what Jesus has done for you. All your sins are forgiven. That's how good this is, you see? And then that leads, oh, we have to move on. That's what leads then, we got just quickly because of time, that, that when God is looking at the hearts, then what's exalted among men is an abomination. That just seems so hard. What, what God is, uh, Jesus is saying here is that if you are if you are trying, if you look good outwardly, but you're full of pride within, that's an abomination before God. It's like somebody standing up again and just preaching that God blessed them because they're healthy and they're wealthy and just look at them. They've got it all together. It's like Gaston, you know, but in the church. That God, that's an abomination to God. You may look like you've got it all together, but if you have pride, then, then, then God detests that. So what, you, what we have to see here is not that God abhors us. God loves us. But he does abhor the pride that is within us. It's true. Why would he? Why wouldn't he? We don't, he wants us to look like Jesus Christ. 
And, his, and, and what does Jesus Christ look like? Jesus Christ, even though he was God, did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself like a servant. Jesus humbled himself even to the point of death on a cross. That's, God wants us to have a heart like that. And so insofar as whether you have it together or you don't have it together, insofar as you are depending upon God by faith, if you are recognizing your weakness and your sins, God does see that, and he delights in that, and he gives you his favor and grace. How do I know this? Because Isaiah tells us in chapter 57, For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in a high and holy place. So there's God, high and holy. That's where he lives. But then Isaiah tells us that he also dwells with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly, to revive the heart of the contrite. Do you see that? That's why Alex kneeled for baptism, but then Keith prayed that she would be raised up in Christ and she is. If we, are, if we are contrite about our weaknesses and our sins, then God has come to live with us. That's where God dwells on earth. He sees our hearts. And so finally then, we look at verse 16. I hope then, having understood or heard all this, that we understand what that means then to, to force our way into this kingdom of grace. Right? It's not that you have to be violent or or take charge, or get lots of things done. Remember, when our Lord Jesus came, he never hurt a soul. He was not violent in any way. And in fact, when one of his main disciples picked up a sword to defend him and show power, Jesus rebuked him harshly and said, Peter, put away your sword. That's not the way the kingdom advances. Our Lord Jesus was gentle and kind. So what in the world could it mean that, that, that the forceful enter their way in. And, and, and again, context. The first half of, of verse 16 has to interpret what this means. The law and the prophets were until John, so that's kind of the Old Testament. And then since John, who is John the Baptist, who went before Jesus, but since John, what's been happening? The good news of the kingdom of God has been preached. Uh, literally the word here, the, the, the kingdom is being evangelized, evangel. It's good news. So we have to understand this. The law and the prophets, the Old Testament, they, they do tell us about God's love and his grace, but there is a lot of failure in the Old Testament. There just is, right? There's a lot of judgment. I, I'm reading through Ezekiel right now, or trying to, uh, and chapter after chapter is judgment and and, and, and the need for repentance, and it's getting a little dark. I mean, one day it was so dark, I'm like, I need some New Testament. I just do. Now, now the Reformed, that's our church. We kind of hash this up sometimes because we're so excited about keeping the Bible united and that it's all about a covenant of grace that we sometimes forget that much of the Old Testament is a foil for the good news. The kingdom of God did not come until God himself became one of us. The second Adam came and came to bring a new creation. And, and, and so that darkness that, we some, like we sang earlier, that we're low in the grave, that, that all of that darkness gives way to the light of Jesus Christ. It's a foil. It's pointing us to what God has done through Christ, that he's come to bring light and life and hope to this world, despite our sin and darkness. As John 3 says, God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Do you get that? Jesus did not come to condemn this world. Or as Jesus himself says in John 5, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. This is good news. This is what we are to preach, not just preachers, but as Rob prayed earlier, that, that our lives would preach this Good news. Many people have said Christians are to be good news people. When people see you coming at work or in the classroom or down the hall, do, do their eyes light up or do they try to avoid you? Do they, do they see you as a good news person who doesn't make any qualms about sin and, and mistakes and, and failure and injustice? 
but as reflecting the good news of God's grace. If you proclaim that Jesus is king in the public square, you better also proclaim that he is the lamb who was slain for the sins of the world. That he has come to bring light and life, not condemnation. So what, what then, if that is true, if, the, if this is good news, what does it mean then that only the forceful make their way in? It's, it's that, we have, that, that we, have, we have decided to, 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 to trust in this good news. That we don't just bl- blandly inherit this kingdom, like, you know, we're born into it, and eh, it's okay. It's like picking a menu off, an, an item off a menu. You know, I'll, I'll do golf, I'll be an accountant, I'll be a Christian, I'll uh, watch some sports, you know. Oh, wait, it's, it, no. It's that we do not have any rest until we find our rest in Christ. That we are people that want to be at peace with God and know that through Jesus Christ, we have that peace. We, we, we were hearing this good news, and we're actively responding to it. So, so we're, 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 we're saying, I want more than anything else to know and love God and live with him forever. Whatever happens in this life, that's what I want most of all. We're, 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 we're forcing our way in, but it's not coming as somebody strong and all together. It's coming as somebody who is weak and has no other hope except God's grace in Christ. Do you see that? It's somebody drowning in an ocean and then a life preserver is thrown and you grab the life preserver because what else can you do? It reminds me very much of Jacob wrestling with the angel who certainly represented Christ, in my opinion. And then Jacob would not let go until he earned God, until he was given God's blessing. He didn't earn God's grace. He was crippled, if you know that story. But all he, he was crippled. He wasn't going to win, so he just said, I will not let you go until you bless me. And the good news of the gospel is this. When we ask For God's grace, we always have it. When we ask for his forgiveness, it is guaranteed to us in Christ. God does not turn away anyone, anyone who comes to him in need, asking to know him. And the good news is we know him through his son. We know the kingdom is here. You want to know God? You want to see what God is like? Learn about Jesus. Read the Gospels. I I dare you to read through the Gospels and see if you just don't fall in love with this man. And then as you you force your way to to get to know him, what you're finding out is it's actually the Spirit in you. The Spirit is calling you back to God who made you. So it's God who is forcing his way through you. That's what this verse means. It does not mean coming to God with our energy and our success, it's, it's coming to him as a sinner needing forgiveness. It's coming as a cripple in need of blessing. It's coming as a child needing an embrace from their father. Is that you? Let's pray. Our God and Father, we thank you for this good news. Thank you for the good news that we've seen displayed this morning and we've seen sung about and prayed about. Lord, I I pray that we would all force our way into the kingdom just by our need and in our weakness. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have hold of us and will never let us go. And we pray these things in your name. Amen. If you have any any questions about what I have said in any part of the the sermon, you you know where to find me, outside the door, or by email, or by text. I'm happy to to always keep talking with you all. But now let's let's respond by celebrating. Don't ask any questions now. Just stand and sing this wonderful hymn that Alex has picked. Maybe not the tune she was expecting, but you'll love this tune. And can it be? We'll sing all.